Good morning. My name is Perry Lang, Reverend Perry, a friend of the family, and uh, it's an honor. Can you hear me now? Testing. I may do it this way. My name is Perry Lang, Reverend Perry, and I want you to know that it's an honor to be of service today. It truly is. I want you all just to take a deep breath with me. I want you all just to take a deep breath with me right now. Breathe in and just let it out. Before we get started, thank someone for turning up the sound. There are a couple of announcements I need to make. For those who didn't get programs, we want you to know that there are additional programs in the back of the sanctuary. So you can have them um, before you leave. The second thing we want you to know is that for those who want to contribute to the Maynard Institute in Dory's memory, you may do so today or at the repass. There's also a box, a donation box, in the back of the sanctuary. We also want to remind everyone here that the repast is going to be held at the Toast Kitchen and Bar at 5900 College Avenue. We also want folks to know that there will be another memorial service on the East Coast sometime between now and May. Those are the announcements that we wanted to get out of the way as we just take a moment, just pause, and celebrate the life of Dory Maynard. For those folks who don't know me, I want you to know that I'm an interfaith minister. I believe that all roads lead to God. It's the integrity of our intention that matters. And with that said, I would ask that you join me for this invocation and prayer. Would you bow your heads with me, please? O thou who is called by many names, but who answers to all who seek your face in love. Thou who is the spark of life, thou who is possibility. We pause now and we acknowledge you and we give thanks for the life of Dory Maynard the life that she shared with us. We also give thanks for your grace, for your mercy, and for your tender kindness, even now in the midst of our sorrow. Keep an eye on this family. Let them know today and always that they are loved. Let them know today and always that they are your beloved. Thank you, Mother, Father, God, for this moment, for this time of reflection, and for reminding us of who we are and whose we are. We are your people, the sheep of your pasture, and we give you thanks and honor on this day. And so it is, amen. We're simply going to follow the program as outlined. And we ask that those folks giving remarks of remembrance, please keep your comments in two minutes. With that said, I believe Barbara Rogers is up. Dory Maynard wrote many excellent columns over the years, and I urge all of you to reread some of them. Uh, you can probably find them through the Maynard Institute website. Those columns challenge us, especially those of us who are journalists, to examine how we might be contributing to the negative stereotypes about people of color. And they ask us to look at ways to correct that. 
The column I am about to read is one that she wrote several years ago about fathers of color, especially her own father, Robert Maynard. For all of his professional success, I think what gave my father the most profound sense of joy was being a dad. Once in a column about raising three children who span three decades, my father described a morning when I called him from college for help with my senior thesis. At the time, he was helping my then 10-year-old brother write a school report, all while using breakfast as an opportunity to teach my baby brother how to talk. There was something in that moment that filled me with a sense of pleasure I cannot adequately describe, he wrote. Last Father's Day, while I was remembering how my dad reveled in his role as a father, soon-to-be President Barack Obama stood in the pulpit of the Apostolic Church of God and delivered a searing condemnation of absentee African-American fathers. Too many fathers are MIA, too many fathers are AWOL, missing from too many lives and too many homes, the New York Times quoted him as saying. To say I was disappointed would be an understatement. Here was a black man, an active black father, clearly devoted to his two children, who better to stand up for black fathers everywhere. It was, I initially thought, his sister soldier moment the term that has come to describe a politician's expedient repudiation of a person or group in order to curry wider political favor. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that perhaps it was the only speech Obama could give. He did not grow up with a father in his home, someone he could call for advice on his senior thesis or anything else. And no matter how much he loved his grandfather, the older man could not make up for the father he barely knew. According to the Times, on Father's Day 2008, Obama told the congregation on the south side of Chicago that his was not a unique experience, that more than half of all black children are growing up in single parent households. That's more than an horrific figure or a dry statistic. It is countless children at risk of being set adrift without the financial support and firm foundation of two loving parents. It's a gaping hole in the lives of every one of those children. All of us should work for a world in which this never happens. And to do that, just as we criticize what is wrong, we need to spend time celebrating what is right. You need look no further than the men we celebrate every Black History Month, Martin Luther King Jr., Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, were all heads of intact Black families. Even while we recognize their contributions to history, we should remember that they were also fathers. Those famous heads of intact black families should be viewed as proxies for all the unsung fathers of color who share the chores and joys of being an active and present father. These are not the men of my wishful imagination. They are my friends, my colleagues, my neighbors, the editor of this newspaper, and soon my oldest brother will join their ranks. They are the men who stepped in and stood by my 13-year-old brother when our father died. Thank you, Jimmy Wood and Hal Logan, for helping to guide him safely into manhood. Committed fathers of color are everywhere throughout my life, and they are virtually nowhere in the media. Their invisibility does us all a disservice. By failing to recognize them, we paint a distorted picture of African-American family life. Equally important, we rob ourselves of important role models. If we want to change behavior, it might be helpful to point out some positive examples. As the legendary journalist Earl Caldwell tells his students at Hampton University, quote, you shouldn't only dig for the ugly, you also need to hold up the beautiful. 
That is one of the best ways to point out all of life's possibilities. He is right. It is so much easier to aspire to that which we know is possible. On Father's Day 2008, we heard about what was wrong with black fathers. I hope Father's Day 2009 marks the date we begin to celebrate African American fathers. Originally published in the Oakland Tribune, June 22, 2009. I met Dory Maynard, a member of what I call the Maynard Dynasty, when she was a student at Middlebury College. She invited me there to discuss my fiction. Try as she might, she couldn't convert me into becoming an objective journalist. <laughs> so Saturday before last, a few days before she died, my family and I sat in her bedroom, and Dory got on me about not being objective about the Giuliani family. I said something about how ironic it was that America's mayor would criticize the upbringing of a president when his father was a convicted long shark enforcer and his daughter a convicted shoplifter. Now, now. Dory said. I was real proud of my uh, muckraking abilities at having discovered that Mr. Giuliani's father shared a prison cell with the Harlem gangster Bumpy Johnson. Dory said I was being hard on the daughter because her offense happened a long time ago. It's only $100. Dory and I never engaged in small talk. She got on my case again when I went to a publication and criticized the movie and noted that Dory Maynard agreed with me. Next time I saw her, she said that she should have known better than not to select her words carefully when having a private conversation with a writer. And even on that grim Saturday, she gave an example of what some called her droll wit. I said, Dory, look at all the people who are visiting you. And she said, yeah, when you die, everybody loves you. <laughs> I said, Dora, you ain't dead yet. She said, that's true. To some, the Maynard family reads like the Book of Job, but they haven't behaved like it. Bob Maynard was discussing future projects up until the day of his death. He was always telling me about his fault lines project, about the ethnic and racial and gender divisions in America. And when he passed, Dory picked up the chalice. Bob's fault lines have become chasms. Instead of meeting Bob's challenge that the media integrate by the year 2000, according to Richard Prince, scores of black journalists are being dismissed from their jobs. Even at NPR, the election of a black president has ushered in an era of post-race good feeling, according to some. Two major news persons, among those who hog up all the opinion space and get to talk about race more than any hundred black scholars and intellectuals, have said that the election of a black president and the selection of a black attorney general means that racism is a dead issue. Both these women live in New York City where hundreds of thousands of Hispanic and black, uh, uh, and black men and women were subjected to stop and frisk searches right under their noses. Blacks have lost half their wealth as a result of subprime loans when over 60% were eligible for conventional loans. The search and destroy strategy of the police has reached the public schools where thousands of black and Hispanic children are subject to arrest for wearing the wrong school colors or talking back to the teacher. A six-year-old was handcuffed for having a tantrum. The private prison industry encourages their bought and sold politicians 
to supply them with more bodies, the way that slaves were treated as merchandise. While the progressive media are concerned about hidden sites all over the world, they just found one in Chicago where black and Hispanic suspects were taken and tortured. And that was exposed by a British newspaper, incidentally. And because the media are occupied by men who've never had such encounters, such a vile actions are blamed on black culture. For them, Michael Brown and Eric Garner and even 12-year-old Tamir Rice were killed because of black culture. Both police union spokespersons and two New York Times columnists agreed that Michael Brown was partially responsible for his death. All about black culture, which doesn't explain why Hispanics get shot, or that the most likely victim of a police shooting is a Native American. Black culture. Councilman Margaret Chen, a Democrat who represents the Chinatown neighborhood, said that the NYPD has unfairly targeted Asians, as well as blacks and Latinos, the model minority. Alex Maynard wasn't wearing a hoodie or stealing cigarettes or selling loose cigarettes when he was forced by the police to give a DNA sample because he looked like another black person. He still bears a scar where he's beaten by members of the notorious NYPD. He was luckier than Adam Kennedy, son of the playwright Adrian Kennedy, who was beaten up in his front yard. They don't just do kids who live in the projects. They don't just do young people either. I was racially profiled while relaxing in this cemetery. My partner and I took time off from our errands to walk in this historic Mountain View Cemetery and somebody in the office called the police. This is what Dory was up against. Chasms, not fractures. What is the face of oppression these days, these post-race days? Women at the Oscars wearing hundreds of thousands of dollars in clothes and millions in jewelry who gave a standing ovation to a call for equal pay for women. The speaker then identified those in Congress who've been against equal pay. Two former inmates, black women, testifying before a panel about prison health, said that black women are dying in prisons because the authorities ignore their symptoms or even ridicule them. As a matter of fact, the California prison system is so bad the federal government has to, uh, said that the medical practices of the California prison system constitute torture. Put that in the Progressive Magazine in the nation. They testified, and they didn't get no standing ovation. So how did Dory answer a media that is so hostile to the interests of blacks that I have recommended that the News Museum in Washington have a hall of shame that would exhibit the front pages of newspapers that encourage race riots and lynchings. Under her direction, the Maiden Institute trained hundreds of young journalists, word ambassadors, who would insist that the media reflect the society in which it resides. Dory, like her predecessor, Ida B. Wells, suffered family tragedies. The early deaths of her father and stepmother and her husband a brilliant architect. She, like Ida B. Wells, was humiliated by racial profiling. In 1884, Ida B. Wells bought a first class uh, ticket for a passage on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad in the ladies' car. When asked to give up her seat to a white man, she refused. She was forcibly thrown off the train. Dory was asked to leave the Hampton Inn. Her offense talking to a white man. This is because in the psychotic mind of the American races, every black woman is a prostitute. This is too, true in 1900, when even church-going black women were subjected to arrest by the NYPD's vice squad. This pattern led to the Tenderlion Riot, which happened after a black man got into a fight with a policeman who was attempting to stop and frisk his girlfriend. The Hampton Inn has refused to apologize. It bothered her. She brought it up every time I talked to her. And now the physical Dory leaves us, but her legacy will be the flame that will inspire all of those who wish to restore journalism as a noble profession instead of the ratings-driven freak show that achieves ratings by satisfying the need for some viewers, miserable in their own lives, he, who can only achieve a high by seeing black and Hispanic people brought low. 
We might be approaching the point of no return as the planet begins to resemble Saturn. What was the obsession of the news media last weekend? Who could identify the colors of a dress? Dory fought for a journalism that includes the points of view of the rest of us. The left out. People who don't own an expensive pair of cufflinks. She, like Nancy and Bob, reached the pinnacle of her profession. But the Maynard dynasty is not done. It will continue with Alex, a brilliant actor and writer. I'm just, just saying that because I publish you, Alex. <laughs> and David, who as a historian will unravel all the lies that have costed us a lifetime career. When I attended the annual Christmas party of the Mainers, I noticed that Dory wasn't present to greet her visitors. They said that she was on the second floor in bed. I figured that she had a cold. But when I saw her, I realized how sick she was. And when I came downstairs, I asked David, how can you stand it? Your mother, your father, and now Dory. And David, cool like his dad, said, we just have to deal with it. Spoken like a man. Thank you, Ishmael and Barbara for setting the stage for the rest of us. I come with condolences, remembrances, and the best of wishes for Dory's family, her mother, Liz Rosen, her brothers, David and Alex. On behalf of the Freedom Forum and the museum in Washington, D.C., partners with the Maynards and friends back to the early 1970s, in the fight for racial justice and equality in the newsroom. It's a partnership that began in Washington, D.C., came out here to Oakland, and one that has continued over the years. And I also bring condolences from my own family. My wife, Maria Elena, and our oldest daughter, Elena, who are here today with us. We've been good family friends over the years. And we live in Oakland because of the partnership between the Freedom Forum and the Maynard family. On my own behalf, I was one of those people who wanted to get in the media but couldn't figure out a way to do it in the 1960s. And for those of us like me who date our media training and, and ambitions back to the 1950s, we remember a time when the media were even more closed than it is today to truth and justice and honesty by people of all colors. In the 1960s, when this became an issue, not only for us, but for the media, media had always been an issue for us. They just didn't care about what we thought until that time when we started getting some, some attention. It was Bob and Nancy and others who came together to train journalists at Columbia University and then in a program that became the Institute for Journalism Education out here in Oakland, California, to take away from top editors the excuse that they couldn't find anybody qualified to fill the bill to report the news with honesty and clarity. And through their summer program, they built not only models to show yet yes we could do the job and we could do it better than many of those who may have been there before us but also that we were bringing stories that needed to be told if the media were really going to do what they should be doing and we're not just stories about ourselves but about everyone bob and nancy were at the pinnacle of journalism careers she at the New York Times, and he at the Washington Post. And they left those positions to found, with, another, with their board, the Institute for Journalism Education. In 1974, when that was founded, it was probably the most diverse media board in the country. It included women, it included men, it included blacks, it included whites, 
It included Latinos, and it included at least one who was gay, Roy Ahrens. Their model, or their mode and their model was one of diversity for all. At a time when media framed race issues in black and white, as the Kerner Commission did in 1968, they saw opportunities for everybody. And they reflected it in their leadership and in all of their programs. They had a two-point effort, one the summer program, a training program, turning out journalists placed in full-time jobs after 14 weeks of training. I a, was a journalism professor. It took us four years to do that with white students and those who came with us. They could do it in 14 weeks. But they also realized you needed an advocacy within the profession. So in presentations to media foundations, associations, corporations, and other organizations, they took our message to the heart of the places where decisions were being made. It was an inclusive movement. They may have been at the pinnacle, but Bob and Nancy did not want to be alone at the top. A victory for one was seen as a victory for all. They weren't trying to keep others down so they could be in the prominent position, but help others learn how to play the game, learn how to make their points, and learn how to be in places where they could influence change. This was all part of the battle for everyone to get front door access to the First Amendment. My contacts for them began in 1978 when I was a professor in journalism at Cal State Northridge, an assistant professor, and working with a group called the California Chicano News Media Association. We knew we could find people who could do the work. We just didn't know how to get them on the job. We could encourage them, but where do we make the, the impact? And Bob and Nancy literally held my hand to show me here's how it works. Here's how they do it. Here's how they make decisions. I remember Nancy telling me, editor, I hope I don't offend anybody here, but he said, uh, editors are like water buffalo. Yeah, she says, yeah, they're like water buffalo. And Bob was there, he goes, yeah, they are. I said, well, what do you mean? She says, well, they travel in herds, they follow the leader, and they gather at the same watering holes. <laughs> so what you need to do is find out where are their watering holes. Then you take your message to them. You go to their meetings. You get in there. Society of newspaper editors, state organizations, regional corporate leaders, wherever we could, foundations, media foundations, we would take the message. And often they would, they didn't say it, but the practice was we got our foot in the door, we got our place at the table, we're gonna keep that door open a little bit more so you can get in there and talk about the Latino, about the Chicano message. Many times in the late 70s and the early 80s, I found myself alongside Bob or Nancy, sometimes uh, J.T. Harris, in front of a group an all-white group of editors, corporate executives, media foundation people carrying the message for diversity. We could have called it a black and tan review. They were the black, I was the tan. But our idea was to get the message there and to get it across. It was delivered to all, heard by some, and acted on by a few. But those few, those editors, those news directors who got the message moved on it. And then we could come through with candidates, with people who could fill the positions. Dory built on that foundation. Dory built on what she was laid before her, but did not content herself with just staying with that. She grew it in new directions. Dory went beyond IJE training of people of color to IJE training of everybody. Telling editors and news people, yes, we can learn what you do and tell others, we've done that. Now you need to listen to us. Here's the fault lines message that my father put together. Here's how I've developed it into a curriculum. They took it into newsrooms and they took it into classrooms and they went in other directions as she set the agenda 
I'm glad you read, Barbara, something she, she had written because it's a compendium across the board of perceptive comments on issues that we all need to pay attention to. But it wasn't all about work. With the wit, with the style, with her persuasive appeal, that really was all her own. Dory could deliver the message in a way that you would not forget. Make an impression and remind everyone that the issues of the 60s are even more important and more pronounced today. She had a hot sauce collection. You know, I'm Chicano, so hot sauce, I'm no stranger to that, I thought. She introduced me to her hottest hot sauce, so I put it on liberally, as I usually do. Got in there, I basically choked on it almost. <laughs> and then I was supposed to be the speaker, you know. Well, with a touch of class, she went and got a glass of water and gave it to me. So when it was my turn to say something, I could and got my voice back. Her Christmas Day, I remember those Ishmael gatherings brought together, the best food in town and the greatest collection of people. And always having an interest. She would ask me not just about work things, but how's the family? How are the daughters? How are the girls? How are things going? She took a personal interest in what she did. She and the Maynard family will always be with us and still are with us. And I would invite you and anyone else who might be interested to some point, take a Maynard moment. Take a Maynard moment. If you've been touched, taught, or read, or heard something that they said or put together, think about it. Or if you work with or for someone who has touched by the Maynards, think about it. I think if newsrooms did that, there wouldn't be a newsroom in this country, or there shouldn't be a newsroom in this country that would not have someone to remember a Maynard moment. I'll close with remarks that I remember from Dory, Dory saying when Elena and I attended her father's services here in Oakland in 1993. As we look ahead, she looked back at her father teaching her how to drive a stick shift at the top of a hill. That was her first lesson. She looked down the hill, he looked at her, showed her what she was supposed to do, and then said, there's nothing to it but to do it. The Maynards have shown us the way and are still showing us the way. There's nothing to it but to do it. Thank you. I bring condolences on behalf of the board of the Institute as well as on behalf of Bay Area News Group. Dory died as she lived. On the morning that she passed, we had a board, uh, we had a call with a funder that needed to happen. And I hadn't heard from Dory yet this morning. We had been communicating by text and email. And so I gave a call to Liz and she had said that Dory was having trouble breathing. But yet, Dory made it very clear that she planned to be on the call. A little bit later, I got a call from Sally who said, is there any way we can get this call off of her docket? Being that she couldn't really talk, being on a call was probably not the best thing for her. So we debated how we were gonna deal with this situation knowing how Dory is about these kind of things. Ultimately, we made an executive decision that she wouldn't be on the call and that I would handle it. So I said, well, I'll send her a text and let her know. I sent her a text. A few moments later, she said, well, still in strategy mode. Well, why don't we just tell them I have an upper res respiratory infection and then I'll just sit on the call and listen. Here's a woman, what turned, up to be, turned out to be a few hours away from death, and she was still pushing towards the work of the Institute, still trying to make sure that that legacy was continued. 
I handled the call. I sent her a text shortly thereafter saying everything went fine, stuck according to script. And she still had the presence to actually send back a compliment saying, nicely done. Thank you for handling the call. She died maybe three hours later. The next day, uh, as it turned out, I already had a fault lines training session that I was supposed to be giving to my colleagues at the Contra Costa Times the next day. My wife asked me, well, are you, are you okay? Are you going to take the day, not go to work? And I was like, <laughs> oh no. Dory was literally on her deathbed trying to work. I think I can get up and go do a fault line session. That's the best way to honor her memory, her legacy, and the work of the Institute. And it was good. Personally, I don't know what I'm going to do without her. And I know that many people feel the same way. She was special to all of us. I'm a wreck, but I know one thing cemented in me seeing her in her bed, in her room, on that computer, trying to continue to work up until the last moments of her life, that the work of the Institute must go on, that it will go on, and that that legacy that was set before all of us will continue. A lot has been written and said about Dory's passion in life the Maynard Institute and her mission to educate as many who would listen and some who would not about the importance of racial stereotypes in the media as a reflection of the world we live in. But I knew another side of Dory. I knew the girl who had become the woman. And though I could speak reams about that young girl and tell my favorite Dory stories, you have the Maynard moments, we had the Dory stories, as we called them going back decades to when she was younger and wilder, I don't want to tell those either. I want to say something to the person who was my Dory, and I want to share with you a brief story that symbolizes Dory to me and to everyone who loved and engaged with her. Dory was, after all, a fighter. She fought to disseminate the important message of racial diversity. She fought to save those she loved who also died from cancer long before their time. Many of you know Dylan Thomas's poem, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. And I would like to read a few verses to Dory. Dory, do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at the close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild women who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned too late they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. And you, my friend, there on the sad height, curse. Bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. When I arrived up here last Saturday to see Dory, she was asleep when I came in the room. I sat down, and without moving or opening her eyes to see who it was, she said, oh, there you are, Nina. She said, don't worry. There's still some magic. We're going to find that magic. And that was Dory, always thinking of others, always able to find the magic. And I know that as much as I will never, ever accept her death, I must remember to find the magic. And for me, that will always be her legacy, finding the magic and raging against the dying of the light. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. It's not warm when she's away Ain't no sunshine when she's gone And she's always gone to know Anytime she goes away
sunshine when she's gone. It's not warm when she's away. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. And this house just ain't no home. Anytime she goes away. She goes away Anytime She goes away Anytime She goes away Oh, better leave your thing alone Oh, better leave your thing alone Oh, better leave your thing alone Oh, better leave I'm very touched by the many memories and tributes to my daughter. Many referred to Dory as fearless, which isn't true and misses a bigger point. Dory wasn't fearless, meaning literally someone without fear, not afraid, scared by anything, but she was brave. She was very brave. She was willing to do things that might scare her to death if she thought they were worth doing, and then she would do them with courage and with grace. I think she was five when she had her first airplane flight. She was very excited to be in a plane, and once the engine started, would look out the window and ask, are we flying now? Finally, when the plane took off, I told her, now we are flying. She took one look out the window, grabbed onto the arms of the seat, and in a panic fell asleep for the rest of the flight. <laughs> that was the beginning of a lifelong fear of flying. Yet she spent her working life on planes because she had places to go and things to do. She was uncomfortable with public speaking, so she worked very hard at it, especially when she found her wonderful presentation coach, Peggy Klaus. She would walk up and down before her turn to go on, practicing her speech over and over, wearing a skin lotion she bought in Woodstock. It had a French vanilla scent, and she said that when you had to tell people things that were hard for them to hear, it helped if you smelt of cookies. <laughs> to me, having courage was so much more admirable than being fearless. She spoke truth to power, even when addressing the most formidable audience. Her voice is silenced now far too early and can only be heard through those who are willing to not only admire her, but to carry on her work in ways both large and small. I thank you for loving her and urge you to emulate her. Initially, my sister and I were bonded because we both were short. <laughs> From Bakersfield to Detroit to Boston 
No matter where in the country she was working, I couldn't wait to hang out with my big sister. I tried to stay up as late as I could, never made it. As the years went on, I would tell her that I would soon be taller than her. The thought never concerned her. In fact, she welcomed it. However, she would still remind me that no matter what, you will always be my baby brother. That to me was the true beauty of Dory's heart. The pure passion and interest she showed in your interests and your life. I've had people come up to me and tell me how my sister brags about me. Oftentimes I would smile and then say to them how many good things I heard about them as well. I've been blessed with the best big siblings one could ever ask for. Since the heavy blow my family took when our father passed away in 93, Dory and David have been a, a wealth of warmth, humor, insight, and support for me. I would not be here without them. From our sister's death, I know that David and I will love harder, stronger for longer, with more patience than ever before. But the world needs all of our help in helping fill that void. She is with you, she is with me, every day and always. And I am so, so proud that I will always be her baby brother. As I began to formulate some thoughts on my sister's life, I wondered where I would find the words to describe what Dory meant to me. Dory was my big sister, my friend, my confidant, my biggest supporter. Since her death, I have been searching for answers, and I found something in my father's words on the importance of family. Dad emphasized the need for us siblings to stick together. Even though we rarely lived in the same place, Dory always found a way for us to stay close. She was always uplifting, fiercely loyal, and looked after me when no one else would did. Dory was the emotional core of our family. She was the one who everyone relied on for support. After my father died in 1993, Dory moved to Oakland to be closer to my brother and I. She was always there for me, for my mom, and for my brother Alex. Her positive outlook and desire to always be there was her most endearing quality to those who knew her best. As a public persona, Dory was an underdog's champion. She supported those who felt, who she felt had no voice, or who she thought were marginalized. It is not surprising that Dory became a spokeswoman for diversity. But none of these wonderful qualities truly encapsulates Dory's essence. When I think of my sister, I think of a passage written by Howard Thurman who spoke of the desire to be loving. He wrote, I want to be more loving in my heart. I want to be more loving. Often there are good and sufficient reasons for exercising what seems a clean, direct resentment. Again and again, I find it hard to hold in check the sharp retort, the biting comeback when it seems that someone has done violence to my self-respect and decent regard. How natural it seems to give as good as I get, to take nothing lying down, to announce to all and sundry in a thousand ways that no one can run over me and get away with it. All this is part of the thicket which in my heart gets caught again and again. Deep within me, I want to be more loving in my heart, to glow with a warmth that will take the chill off a room when I, which I share with those lives, touch mine in traffic of go, my gumming, goings and comings. I want to be more loving. I want to be more loving in my heart. It is often easy to have the idea in mind, to plan to be more loving, to see it with the mind and give assent to the thought of being loving. This is crystal clear, but I want to be more loving in my heart. I must feel like loving. I must ease the tension in my heart that ejects a sharp bar the stinging word. I want to be more loving in my heart, that with unconscious awareness and deliberate intent, I shall be a kind and gracious human being. Thus, those who walk the path with me may find it easier to be loving, to be gracious because of the love of God, which is increasingly expressed in my living. 
I want to be more loving in my heart. Dory makes me want to be more loving, even when I am resentful. She made unconditional love look easy, even though I knew it wasn't easy for her. That always present smile was a crystal, a crystal, a crystal reflection from her consciousness, which was always clear because she respected all people equally. She was that unconscious awareness. She was a kind, most gracious human being. Thank you. Near the end of Dory's husband's life, Dory said she wanted to perform a ritual. When he passed, the intent was to release him and allow him to move on. Dory, thank you. Thank you for your insight, your work, your friendship, and your love. We release you and you're free. was taught in seminary <clears throat> that some people get to God through awe. They can look at a mountain, they can see the vastness of the ocean, and they just know. It was taught that others get to God through reasoning. They have to problem solve. This is, therefore this is. Was also taught there, there are some folks that get to God through the mystery of life. They understand that the eagle and the bear and the rock are one. As Liz told me earlier, Dory was a woman of the word Many times she reasoned her way, and that's okay. It doesn't matter how you get there. The point is to get there. Whether you get there through all, whether you get there through reasoning, or whether you get there through understanding the mystery, the notion is to acknowledge that there is something bigger than we are, something bigger than we all are. With that said, I want to share a couple of simple readings so that we can reflect in this time on something bigger than we are. The first is taken, it's an excerpt from Cahil Gibran from the Prophet. The second, it's from the Baha'i tradition for the departed woman. And the third reading is from the Psalms. Whatever your tradition, however you get there, let's get there in this moment. Let's be present in this moment because we all must walk down this path. The prophet says this when speaking of death. For what is it to die but to stand naked in the wind and melt into the sun? And what is it to cease breathing but to free the breath from its restless tides that it may rise and expand and seek God unencumbered? A 
Abdul Baha says this, O Lord, whose mercy has encompassed all, whose forgiveness is transcendent, whose bounty is sublime, whose pardon and generosity are all embracing, and the lights of whose forgiveness are spread throughout the world. O God of glory, I entreat thee fervently and sincerely to cast upon thy handmaiden, who has ascended unto thee the glances of the eye of thy mercy. Robe her in the mantle of thy grace, bright with the ornaments of the celestial paradise, and sheltering her beneath the tree of thy oneness, illumine her face with the lights of thy mercy and thy compassion. Bestow upon thy heavenly handmaiden, O God, the holy fragrances born of the spirit of thy forgiveness. Cause her to dwell in the blissful abode. Heal her griefs with the balm of thy reunion. And in accordance with thy will, grant her admission into thy holy paradise. Let the angels of thy loving kindness descend successively upon her and shelter her beneath thy blessed tree. And from the psalmist, Psalms 139, he writes, O Lord, thou hast searched me, and thy know me. Thou knowest when I sit up, and when I lie down, thou discernest my thoughts from afar. Thou searchest out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is in my tongue, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou dost beset me behind and before and layest thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Whether shall I go from thy spirit? Or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there thy hand shall lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, let only darkness cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is light to thee. The night is bright as the day, for the dark darkness is as light to thee. It's important to remember the sacred texts of the ancestors, no matter what our tradition and no matter what path gets us there. To remember that there's something greater than we are, something wiser than we are. Dory knew that. Dory knew that. With all that said, in this eclectic group, the one thing I would like us to do before we leave today. When we're at a football game and someone really does well, we all stand and we cheer and we shout. And when we're at a basketball game and someone makes that three-pointer, we all stand and we cheer and we shout. For a life well lived, as Dory has lived, let us stand and give her a standing ovation. Bravo! Bravo, Jane! Bravo! Bravo! Bravo. 
Please remain standing. The love of God, the peace of God, rest, rule, and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen.